Hello everyone, I'm Jane Alexander and my pronouns are she, her. Welcome to WWF's The Green Room, a space where we talk about all things related to the climate crisis, learn about the incredible work being done, and what each of us can do to help prevent the worst impacts of a warming world. You may recognize me from having been on WWF before this past year uh, online and uh, my work as an actress. And currently my work with the Audubon Society involves protecting the boreal forests of Canada primarily <clears throat> and helping First Nations people become guardians of the land. And uh, I'm passionate about that and protecting the animals around the world that are being impacted by changes in climate. Today I'm joined by WWF's Nikhil Advani and Ali Ivanov. Would you like to introduce yourselves? Let's start with you, Nikhil. Hi, Jane. Uh, thanks for being here today. Um, and thank you so much for all you're doing for, for wildlife conservation around the world. It's a real honor to get to speak to you today. Um, so my name is Nikhil Advani. I'm a director at World Wildlife Fund, and I lead a program called Climate Communities and Wildlife. Uh, where we're researching how climate change is impacting people and wildlife across the world and developing and implementing solutions to help them adapt to those changes. Um, I'm from Kenya originally, born and brought up there, and I moved to the U.S. in 2000. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, would you like to introduce yourself, uh, Ali, and tell us a little bit about what you're passionate about? Yes, hello. Thank you, Jane. Um, I'm honored to be with you all here today. Um, my name is Ali Ivanov, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm a communications intern here at WWF and a junior at the University of Oregon. Unilocally, Alaska is a small Inuit community on the Bering Strait in which I call home. When there, I love soaking in the beauty of nature and so advocating and fighting to keep the Arctic and the cultures alive and healthy and thriving is really what I'm passionate about. That's great. That's great. Um, so let's hop right into today's topic, protecting wildlife in a warming world. Often when we think or hear about the climate crisis, it's in terms of its impact on people, on um, landscapes and on the economy, which are all very important to be aware of. And even when we hear about climate change impacting wildlife, the animals that first come to mind are polar bears, and other animals in colder habitats. But there is a much larger issue at hand. Nikhil, can you tell us a little bit about how climate change is impacting animals and which are the most vulnerable to warming temperatures? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, you already mentioned polar bears, and I think that for some time now, they've been the poster child for the impacts of climate change on animals. But, but the impacts spread well beyond just polar bears. Um, many other ice dependent species, of course, because they're losing their habitat at such a rapid rate. Um, corals are another group that, that seem to get a lot of attention and, and they're suffering from coral bleaching uh, due to warming ocean temperatures. But there's also, there's so many other animals and there's also complicated ways in which um, people are being affected by climate change. And the ways in which people respond to those changes in climate can often be harmful to animals as well. Um, so for example, we find that, that rural communities that live in and around national parks will sometimes turn to, to coping mechanisms during times of drought, for example, that can be harmful to animals and um, biodiversity in general. Things like chopping down trees to make charcoal um, as, a, as a source of income because they've lost their entire harvest. Um, so a lot of our work is focused on that, those indirect impacts through humans. Um, but also, we're also looking at, at many of the direct impacts to species. Um, you know, drought, for example, is a really big one. In Southern Africa recently, um, there was a very severe drought. And it has impacts on species that are heavily water dependent because they can't get enough water, like elephants, um, and also species that need a lot of food and pasture. Uh, because if there's no water, then there's not enough plants to eat. Um, and then we'll even see knock-on effects on predators. And, and I think later on, we're going to talk a bit about tigers. 
Um, because if the prey aren't getting enough sustenance, then there's not enough animals for the for predators like tigers to eat. Um, so just a glimpse in, into some of the impacts, you, you know, we're seeing it across almost all groups of species. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, Ali, are you seeing uh, impacts on animals and climate change from climate change where you live? Yes, Jane. Um, in my lifetime, I have witnessed the impacts of a warming world and the detriments it's caused to um, our coastlines and our communities. Um, both have started to erode into the sea and the rivers, um, and not only the landscapes shifting, but the alarming changes are also taking away the habitats, as Nikhil was talking about. Um, so some animals that I've seen directly impacted are um, caribou and salmon in particular, their migration patterns have drastically changed over the years. And also um, marine mammals and seabirds will often wash up dead on the oceans, um, ocean shores because they have no place to go. There's no ice. Um, so it's very heartbreaking to see the effects that loss of habitat has had in our communities, but it is um, it is really good to keep looking forward. Yeah. I know that for those of us uh, living in the U.S. and Canada and Mexico, it's possible that we could see monarch butterflies migrate depending on where we live in each of those countries. But I also understand that this migration is threatened by a change in weather patterns to places where monarchs breed in the summer and live in the winter. Now, can you tell us a little bit, Nikhil, about the work being done on the ground to protect wildlife habitats like those of the monarch? Yeah, very good question. You know, monarch butterflies, um, uh, they're an amazing species uh, and hopefully you've had a chance to see them. Um, they're also a very wide ranging species, right? So the Eastern population in the US uh, overwinters in Mexico. And then during the summer, they'll fly as, nor as far North as Canada. And they can have up to three to five generations in a single year. So they're also a very complicated species to, to understand the impacts of climate change because they're so wide ranging and there's so many generations. Um, they're also a species where it's not necessarily easy to, to implement sort of direct climate adaptation strategies um, as we might do for some other species, again, which, which we're gonna talk about in just a second. But for monarchs, it's really about ensuring that they have adequate habitat um, because they're also threatened by habitat destruction and pesticide use. And if we can decline, if we can cause those two things to decline um, across their range, then that will be a huge help um, to the monarch butterflies. As far as the, the weather extremes that are affecting them, there's not a whole lot we can do. Uh, you know, there, there's been instances of uh, severe frosts where they overwinter in Mexico and that's killed off large chunks of the population. And then when they're migrating through the US, there's been times where they've encountered severe drought, uh, and that's Im impacted the availability of nectar, for example, which is the fuel which they need to migrate. So those changes in weather and climate are harder for us to mitigate against. Um, but given that the species has such a high reproductive rate, and it has so many generations in a year, chances are they will be able to adapt to those changes over time if we ensure that they have adequate habitat. Mm. Well, for some of the interventions that you just spoke about, you're telling us that there's this special relationship between people and animal habitats. And I have to say, uh, a year and a half ago in 2020, I put in a pollinator garden uh, here where I live in Nova Scotia just a small one. I could only find one milkweed plant uh, to buy and put in the ground, but I put it in the ground. And this year I had so many monarch butterflies. They went right to that milkweed and to the Joe pie weed. And I saw a pair mating uh, butterflies. And the, after they separated, she went immediately into the garden to the milkweed plant and laid her eggs. And I thought, whoopee, what a success story. It was so delightful. And I just thought, well, everybody can do this. We just have to get a milkweed plant or whatever we need in a habitat and, and um, 
try to make things right in our own backyard. And if we all did that, maybe we'd start to make a profound difference. Allie, what do you think? Have you experienced a habitat a disruption up where you live? And what is the relationship between people and their habitats? Yeah, um, as I had spoken about before, Jane, we have experienced some severe impacts just seen in my lifetime. Um, and that is also harming communities as much as the wildlife, I would argue. Um, indigenous communities such as mine exist within the ecosystem. We're not separate. The land and water provide the sustenance that we need and have enabled our survival for thousands of years in the same ways our ancestors have. So with the warming climate and changing habitats and dying wildlife, all of the shrinking habitats and the um, culture that our ancestors have practiced is in danger. So the relationship and the land is very much put at risk with this crisis. So with that, Nikhil, do you have anything to add on why habitats are important? Yeah, I mean, you know, for the example, the example that I just gave on monarchs is a classic one, right, where, um, and this is true for so many other species out there, that animals and, and plants have these natural capacities to adapt to changes in climate. Um, in some cases, we might need to lend a, help, a helping hand with, with specific interventions, um, you know, like water provision, for example, during times of drought. Um, or we're doing a few projects on artificial nesting for different bird species as a way to give their reproductive rate a boost. But ultimately, if we can ensure really good habitat, um, if we can also ensure that we're prioritizing what we call climate refugia, which are areas that are, are likely to be more resilient than others in the face of climate change, that will go a huge way um, to facilitating the natural capacity of species to adapt to changes in weather and climate. Um, and we are already seeing that. You know, we are seeing, especially species that have fairly quick generation times and high reproductive rates, we're already seeing evolutionary changes that are that are clear indications that these species are adapting to some of these changes in weather and climate. Great. Okay, well, I have uh, two more questions before we wrap up things today. And the first, Nick Hill, um, you're currently working on a project with the world's largest big cat, the tiger. Now I'm the chair of the Conservation Council for Panthera. So I care a lot about the big cats and how they're being saved today and working on that as well, but not quite as, as, as intensely as you are. So would you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Uh, and so this is what I referenced earlier, right? There's a, uh, these are sort of the more specific interventions that we're doing to help species on a location by location basis. So we've actually got two projects ongoing for tigers. One is in Thailand. And the issue there is that their prey numbers are declining, um, largely driven by drought. Um, again, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, they don't have enough food and water. So we're actually restoring the habitat, restoring grasslands, um, installing a salt lick and installing um, water ponds as a way to boost the prey numbers and in turn increase prey availab availability for tigers because tigers have such high prey requirements. And then the other project, which we just started this year, is in Nepal. And tigers have been documented at um, pretty high elevations in Nepal, suggesting that they might be you know, venturing to higher and higher elevations on a more consistent basis now. And what we're trying to do is, is create a, a habitat corridor of sorts to facilitate that movement. Um, so we're installing artificial water ponds um, as you go up in elevation um, in a part of Nepal. And for, it, it's, it's intended to have similar outcomes to the Thailand project to, to increase prey numbers and facilitate that movement of tigers if, if they so choose. Wonderful. That's great. Um, <clears throat> so, that and all the work currently being done to help and conserve and protect species and animals around the world is very important, which leads me to my next and final question of the day, because I'm always looking for different ways to help wildlife too. Allie, 
Can you give us some tips on what people can do to help wildlife in a warming world? Yes, of course. Um, one of the big things that I think we need to do to, is reduce our carbon emissions, and that involves all members of society, including individuals, businesses, and corporations, even state and local governments. So it's important for us to hold our elected officials accountable by reaching out and letting them know why it's important to protect species and act to reduce emissions. Some things that come to mind when looking to protect wildlife in a warming world are to help maybe create more habitat opportunities for them by doing things that I like, like planting wildflowers and pollinators, um, or even just um, conserving our water consumption. Um, well, thank you so much. I think that really right, wraps it up today. Thank you so much, Nikhil and Ali, for your time and for all of you joining us today. We are so excited that you were able to join us for this episode of The Green Room. Have a great day.